If you all want to follow along this morning, you can turn to the book of Acts. I'm going to consider a story you know really well already <clears throat> from Acts chapter 2. I'll read you the first four verses and we'll go from there. First four verses of Acts chapter 2 say, On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. And you know how the story goes on from there. Um, lots of people were visiting Jerusalem and they all came running and they listened to the disciples, particularly Peter, but there was 120 followers of Jesus there who all were able to, when they spoke, people could hear them in their own language. And uh, at the end of the end of the day, I guess, we assume it's one day, uh, at the end of the day it says, uh, you know, thousands were baptized and joined their group. It's an exciting story, but I wanted to back up and consider something important because we always speak about the Holy Spirit and evangelism, but nobody's ever had you know, 3,000 people join our church in a day. But the Holy Spirit is still at work. Maybe there's another ingredient. Let's consider a little bit. I want to, uh, that was the New International Translation or version I read to you just now. Um, I'm going to read to you from the New King James Translation here. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Sounds pretty similar. But here's the part that's different, kind of a little hidden gem. In this first verse, in, chapter, in verse 1 of chapter 2, the New International simply says, all the believers are meeting together in one place. There's a little bit of a clue that if they were meeting, they'd be in one place. And if they're meeting, they're obviously together. So why meeting together? But notice how we have it here in the King James, and you've heard this before. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all with one accord, and they were in one place. There's something about this being with one accord I wanted to think about today. First, though, I asked myself the question, so what's Pentecost anyways? Was that a special occasion? You know, maybe what we need is a day of Pentecost. What's Pentecost mean? Does anybody know? 50? Yes. Did you know that or did you just look at it, Patty? You have it here to note. Okay, good. Pentecost means literally, it's just a Greek word that literally means 50th. You know, so like when I get to be 50, I'll have my Pentecost, 50th birthday. Well, that's important because as Patty points out, Really, um, all of these disciples and followers of Jesus were also Jews or children of Israel. And 
they were celebrating the Feast of Weeks. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Feast of Weeks, but the Feast of Weeks, <coughs> excuse me, the Feast of Weeks had to do with the, the, the spring harvest. You were, uh, you had the festival of the first fruits when the first harvest uh, was available. What do you call it? Ripened, I guess is the right word. It was ready to be harvested. And uh, if you ever want to know about feasts, you have to go to Leviticus 23 or Exodus 23 to find out about the feasts. So we have the, the feast of the first fruits, and uh, you, you, you bring a sheaf of your, your harvest, your grains or whatever you happen to be growing. But now here's where the Feast of Weeks comes in. I'll just read you and you'll get the idea where the 50 comes in. You shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath. Oh, incidentally, that's important. Um, that you, you, you bring your sheaf of grain and the priest waves it before the Lord as a, as a thank you on the day after the Sabbath. So you, you bring it on a Sunday after the Sabbath and you bring it. Okay, and so you should then count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, that's the first fruits, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. So seven Sabbaths is 49 days, and the Sunday is 50. And then you offer an offering to the Lord, and you bring from your dwellings loaves and so on, and I won't read you the rest of it. There's a whole thing you do to celebrate the Feast of Weeks. So now you understand why Pentecost means 50th. It's the 50th day after the Feast of the first fruits. So it makes more sense now why this starts off, uh, the, the description here in Acts 2 starts off, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, well, uh, which is to say when the 50th day had arrived, you have your celebration. And what day of the week was it? A Sunday. Because remember, you, you start off from the first fruits, which was on a Sunday. You go seven Sabbaths, and the next day is a Sunday. So they were all gathered on the 50th day, which was a Sunday. And they were all with one accord, and they were all in one place. Well, if they're gathered together, one would hope they're in one place. They didn't have Zoom in those days, thankfully. And that leaves us with this expression, one accord. You'll notice that in the New International Version there, they didn't really say anything about it. They just said they're all gathered together in one place. So I thought, well, let me, let me consider this one accord. Because if you've heard people speaking French, and you say something that's impressive, your, your listener might say, you know, d'accord, d'accord, which is to say, you know, I'm in accordance, or I agree. So I thought, hmm, what does one accord mean? Well, I'm sure you've heard of it before and thought, well, and it has to do with the unity of those, those believers in those days. And what does unity mean? Does it mean that they're all you know, the same, they all believe the same? Does it mean they all think the same? Here's how I go about figuring that out sometimes. So I, I did a little research. I said, well, what's, you know, what, um, where did this come from? Because some modern translations don't really talk about this being of one accord. They just say that everyone was gathered together. I think it must mean something else. So, you know, the Greek word, I, I don't pronounce these Greek words, but I'll try here. Homothymodon is the word that's translated in the New King James as one accord. I thought, well, let's see where that comes from. Well, it turns out that it's kind of a homemade word that Luke made up. It's used 12 times anywhere in the Bible, and 11 of them are in the book of Acts. And the other one's in the book of Romans. Um, I guess Paul must have kind of caught on to it here from Luke. It's kind of a homemade word because it's a combination of two. It's a combination of two Greek words, uh, homo, I guess you'd say, and thymos. Here's, here's what those words mean. Uh, this word 
homo, I guess as you would call it, means literally just together. You know, the flowers are together. We're together in this room. <coughs> Excuse me. This word thymos, on the other hand, is a little more powerful. It's used quite a few times in the New Testament. It's translated or sometimes used to re represent fierceness or indignation. But most often it's used, um, at least in the old uh, King James translation, it's, it's considered wrath, which is, you might say, like um, uh, the practical description here of, of the Greek word is something that's boiling up. Kind of like, you know, when you put your pasta in and leave it on high and it boils all over your stove. Something is boiling up or passionate. Um, so if you put the two words together, the way uh, Luke does, he, he makes a new one, hymothymodon, which is, you know, they, his, he kind of put the two words together. You'd get something kind of like passionate togetherness. That's my, my, uh, my description of it. Or with one passion, passionate togetherness. Well, okay, that's a start. But as I say, he used it 11 times, so he used it 10 other times in the book of Acts, and um, Paul used it over in the book of Romans. I thought we could understand what it means to be of one accord by looking at the other place where he used this same homemade word, I'm a thymodon. So here's some other places he used it. Um, over in Acts chapter 7, not too far away, Acts chapter 7 is the story of Stephen. Uh, kind of has a sad ending, right? So Stephen is arrested, and he, he's before the assembled experts and self-righteous people. And Acts chapter 7 uh, is mostly Stephen's speech, his sermon uh, to the, to the uh, high priest and the priests and the Sanhedrin and so forth. Um, the story, I won't read you the sermon because where Luke uses the word is kind of at the end. Skip all the way down to verse um, 54. Luke, uh, Stephen has finished his sermon. I'm not sure he was really finished, but he kind of got interrupted. It says, when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven, saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He addressed this to the Sanhedrin. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now you've heard that story before and if you notice, there's no one accord in there. That's because I read that to you from the New International Version. But let's take a look at what it says over in the New King James Version in the same story. They cried aloud. I'm going to skip just to the part where they respond to, to Stephen saying he'd seen Jesus standing at the right hand of God. They cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and they ran at him with one accord. Well... How does that like fit to fit with what we read earlier? Uh, you know, that the, the uh, believers were all meeting, they were all of one accord. Well, you can picture what's happening, right? The Sanhedrin, those, those uh, religious leaders and the high priests, the high priest and the priests and the Sanhedrin, they're all listening to Stephen. And when he says, look, I see Jesus, you know, standing at the right hand of God, they all cried out with a loud voice. They stopped their ears. You can picture like, you know, a child having a temper tantrum, but I guess that's the way the religious leadership was in those days. Stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. So you can picture everyone jumping up from their seat and they're all moving together. That's what one accord means. They ran with one accord. So that's where another place that Luke uses his, his homemade word is chapter 7. 
Here's another place over in chapter 12. Now, chapter 12, you know, there's, there's a story there about Herod and difficulties. We're going to go right down to uh, the end of the story here. You know, Herod had been persecuting the church and he'd arrested Peter. And most of Acts 12 tells the story, you know, Peter's in prison and so forth. Um, but then we get to the kind of the, 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 as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story about Herod at the end of chapter 12 in Acts. Skip right down to verse 20. Now, Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. But they came to him with one accord, and having made Blastus, the king's personal aide, their friend, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food from the king's country. Uh, so the people of Tyre and Sidon realized, you know, they, in this case, I guess, almost literally were biting the hand that fed them and decided they needed to, uh, they needed to come to Herod and, and smooth things over. And they did that by making friends with his personal assistant and so forth. But notice this. The people of Tyre and Sidon, they came to him with one accord. Well... The point is, Tyre and Sidon are two separate cities if you look at a map of Palestine. And they decided they'd better get, better get together and go visit Herod and work out some terms so they continue to get food. Smart maneuver. The, uh, the New International Version, as well as other modern translations, say something which is helpful here. It says, well, now, the Herald, uh, Herald, hear me. Herod had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And here's what it says. They now joined together and sought an audience. Well, that makes sense. Now, the people of Tyre and Sidon didn't necessarily think alike, worship alike, or anything else. But they had a common purpose. They needed to keep the food coming. So they joined together. That's what, you know, as Luke uses this uh, homemade word he has, with one accord to describe the fact that they joined together and went to see Herod to work out um, you know, peace arrangements so that they would continue to get food. The story goes on and tells how you know uh, they tried to kind of flatter Herod and that didn't go so well. Well, actually it went really well, but Herod took the flattery and it says an angel struck him down and he died. Our purpose of the story was to understand what one accord means. So here we have two different groups of people who join forces to accomplish a common purpose. Okay, now, um, next, we have um, Acts chapter 15, if you want to uh, turn over there. And i got to find my place. Um, let me I kind of lost my my notes here here it is here this is a story about um Paul and Barnabas up in the city of Antioch in northern Syria. And there was quite a bit of debate about the proper, you know, there was a lot of Gentiles joining the church. And, well, the Jews had all kinds of different religious practices and which ones were appropriate to, to, to ask the Gentiles to follow and so on. So in any event, we're again trying to look and understand what this idea of being of one accord means. And we can find it down here. Go down to verse uh, 20. Uh, let's see. Well, let's skip all the way to verse 24. Um, they're writing the, the kind of the results of the, the uh, discussion. Verse 24 of Acts chapter 15 says, Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words unsettling your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such command. It seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, 
to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of Jesus. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. And it goes on to describe what, you need, what they need to do. Let's go back to where it talks about one accord in verse 25. The council writing to the believers out there, the Gentile believers, writes, whoever wrote the, uh, whoever wrote the, the little letter here, wrote, it seemed good to us being assembled with one accord. Well, being assembled describes a meeting. They got the people together, and if you read up here, it's the apostles and elders and so on. Um, but the point is, being assembled is one idea. They had a meeting. The second thing is, with one accord. Well, one accord here, they came to agreement. They had a similar purpose. Um, now, it turns out that these people didn't necessarily, you know, all have the same ideas generally, because you remember even later on, Paul and Barnabas went their separate ways because they couldn't agree on just how they were going to conduct their evangelism and so forth. But the point being is that at this particular gathering, they with one accord, meaning we would say nowadays, I think it was a unanimous decision. All, the pe all of the church leaders who met together came to a, a conclusion and Everyone was in agreement with that conclusion. They had one purpose. And they wrote this letter and they, they explained to the Gentiles what to do. Okay, we have two more examples here I'll share with you and then we'll draw some conclusions. Um, the next one's over in uh, Acts chapter 19. 19, by that time Paul's on his missionary journeys. And we're going to skip all the way down to verse 28. Um, this section here is Paul went to Ephesus, and um, he had quite a, quite a great success. Um, let's see. Um, people were, were interested in, in Paul's preaching and so forth. Uh, but there was a fellow named Demetrius there, a silversmith, and he, he was upset because um, they made a lot of money in Ephesus from selling idols and so forth and worship aids and so forth. And uh, <clears throat> he said, you know, we, we got to get rid of Paul and his followers because it's going to destroy our income. It's going to be really bad for the economy. So we got to get rid of them. And uh, Demetrius kind of got out on the street corner, I don't know just where, but he gives a speech here, and I guess we'll start in verse 26. He says, Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they're not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised, and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. Right? The point is, it's going to be bad for us. And they're even going to, you know, um, disrespect our God. Now, when they heard this, that's the people there in Ephesus, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of Ephesus! And the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord. Having seized, oh boy, these guys with Greek names are hard to say, Gaius and Aristarch. Aristarchus, Macedonians, who were Paul's traveling companions. Um, and they, they had a, we won't go on. They had a whole big discussion there, and finally the people, you know, calmed down, and they were able to get, let, you know, Paul's companions go. But here's the thing, you can picture this Demetrius guy giving his speech, and all the people who were listening to him there in the city worked up the rest of the city, and in verse 29, it says, The whole city was filled with confusion, <coughs> and the uh, whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater. That's the gathering place. Rushed into the theater with one accord. Once again, it's kind of like those priests and the people of the Sanhedrin um, 
rushing forward to grab Stephen. These people are passionate. Now, they're passionate maybe for a poor cause. They're passionate about their goddess Diana. But they're passionate, and they all have the same purpose at the same time. Does it mean they all you know, thought the same things, did the th same things, said the same things? No, it's a bunch of people around the city. But on this one particular topic, they were in agreement that it would be a really bad idea for everybody to disrespect and, and uh, you know, attack Diana here by listening to Paul. And so with that idea, they were passionately together. If you'll use my definition of, of Luke's homemade word, they were passionately together and they all rushed into the theater at the same time because they had the same purpose. They wanted to put a stop to Paul's work to undo their goddess. And then the last one here we'll look at is over in Romans chapter 15. Um, Romans chapter 15. Paul writing to the Romans and he uses Luke's homemade word. And uh, we won't go into too much detail here. Let's just look at verses 5 and 6. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I read this in a modern translation. You won't be surprised probably to find that where it says, so that with one mind... That's where with, with one accord. Paul's prayer, if you will, since he's asking God to bring this about, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind you may glorify God the Father. Here, I think, is really the, the idea, uh, the, the essence of, you can see from several instances in Acts, right, that this isn't just a, an agreement on, you know, what kind of clothes we should wear or <coughs> what kind of music we should sing in church. That's not really what one accord means. One accord is this passionate togetherness that motivated the whole city of Ephesus to run into the Colosseum or the whole uh, Sanhedrin to jump up and run and grab Stephen and take him out and stone him. As I say, those are kind of uh, uh, negative experiences, not looking that we want to have a mob mentality and, and lynch somebody. But the idea is that everybody had the same purpose and were willing to work together to accomplish it. Um, maybe... maybe um, the example of the group of, of Christian church leaders coming to agreement on what should be asked of the Gentiles is a better example. Did they always agree about how church should be conducted or where they should go? No, because we have stories later about debates and discussions you know, coming about. But they did come to agreement on what should be asked of the Gentile believers. And in that way, they were of one accord. Paul here writing to the Romans takes the idea one step further, which is, may God give you, the church members there in Rome, may God give you folks the same attitude towards each other that Jesus had. Okay, with one accord, you may glorify God. I think that's what we need right there. That's the point of the, all of this. You see, those, those uh, disciples and the 120 believers that were in the upper room uh, when the, the uh, mighty rushing wind came and the Holy Spirit and the, the preaching came and everybody joined the church that day, it didn't just start that day. Because if you go back to Acts chapter 1, after Jesus was taken up into heaven, down in the middle of Acts chapter 1, it says, they all went back to the room where they were staying and they prayed and prayed and prayed for direction. They were with, and if you go back and find the King James, New King James or a translation that understands Luke's you know, handy homemade word here that is translated one accord, 
They were all of the same purpose. They were seeking God's will and direction after Jesus was taken from them. Now, Jesus had been taken from them only a short time before, and here's why I say that. Um, Pentecost means 50th, the 50th day since the first fruits. And the first fruits wasn't too long, you know, after this, it was somewhere in the spring harvest around Easter time. Easter time, of course, is when Jesus was raised. And haven't you read where it's, it says that for 40 days Jesus visited with the people? Different times. He appeared to them in the upper room when they were all there with one accord. They were all together. They were all praying and seeking guidance. Um, and one time, Thomas was doubting, and Jesus showed up. They were all together seeking God. Jesus visited them. This wasn't long after Jesus returned to heaven. It might have been even 10 days since the last time Jesus had appeared. But they were all figuring out what to do now that they didn't see Jesus, you know, day in and day out. They were all seeking God's guidance. And in that way, they were all of one accord. They all had the same mission, the same purpose. It says here on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting with one accord. They were still with one accord, seeking God. Jesus had told them specifically to stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came. They were all with one purpose and one mind. And when they were all there with one purpose, which was to, to um, carry forward Jesus' work, then the Holy Spirit came among them. Maybe it's not so much sitting and waiting for the Holy Spirit to get around to come. Maybe it's, as uh, Paul encourages us here in Romans, that God will give us the same attitude toward each other that Jesus had. Jesus didn't make everyone think and act, believe, sing, whatever like him. It was just really that the love for each other, the respect for each other's viewpoints, the singleness of purpose, which is really what's important. Remember all those people who were out there in the lynching mobs for uh, Stephen and the Paul's traveling companions there in Ephesus, in that moment in time, they were united with one purpose. I think we should all pray that God gives us the attitude towards each other, that we will be united with one purpose. And then the Holy Spirit has people he's ready, to, he can work with. Now, you know, you can, some, some kind of explanations of that came, or, or further uh, development of the idea came to me as I was kind of digging this out and studying along a little bit. You remember Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered, not in one place, but wherever two or three are gathered in my name, what does it mean to be gathered in his name? To be gathered in his purpose, right? For his work. So it's not simply a matter of just, you know, all getting together on the beach to have a cookout. That's getting together. Getting together in Jesus' name is to get together to work on his purpose, to adopt the same attitude towards each other that Jesus had, which is... Um, graciousness, forgiveness, where things have gone wrong, um, and a willingness, this is um, a willingness to put the value of the mission of the group ahead of my pride. Is my goal to somehow be outstanding and to have people, you know, exclaim over what I've done or to thank me? Then I'm not working for the group. I'm working for myself. For all these people to be of one accord, whether it's these people at Pentecost or the church leaders or the lynch mob for Stephen or the other people, always meant that in that moment, they were united for one purpose. 
they were united, and then, you know, as I say, Jesus calls us to gather in his name. If we gather for doing the work of Jesus, it's not about me and what I've done. It's about what God is going to do. And then I'm gathered with everybody else to accomplish that purpose. And you know what? My idea might not be the one everyone takes because the Spirit's moved somebody else. But if we're one of cord, I don't worry about that because it doesn't matter if it's my idea or somebody else's idea. What matters is that we are all ready to work in Jesus' name. So uh, just kind of, I really like this capstone of Romans 15. May God, who gives us encouragement, give us the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one accord, we may be ready to glorify God in whatever we do. For our closing hymn today, we're going to sing the sweet, sweet spirit, which is number 262, I think. 266? Oh, well. <laughs>